Hello, everybody. A very warm welcome wherever you're joining us from around the world. Welcome to the latest RTRS webinar on new conversion factors and the soy footprint calculator. Uh, this is a series of webinars. And just before we start, I'd just like to remind people about the other webinars in this series. So we had a fantastic webinar in July looking at innovations in sustainable finance. Later this month, we're going to be talking to actors from across the supply chain about the value of certification as we see increased demand for RTRS credits and chain of custody. And then in October, we have a webinar looking at regulation, particularly from a European perspective and how that impacts on all of us across the soy supply chain. Today, I just wanted to share with you some important practical information so if you haven't used Zoom before, or if you're not familiar with the translation function, we are providing this webinar in three different languages, English, Spanish, and Portuguese. If you wish to hear in Spanish or Portuguese while I'm speaking in English, then pass your mouse over the interpretation ball. You pass at the bottom of your screen, you'll see next to the green box, a ball that says interpretation. Click on the language, your preferred language to receive the translation. If you'd like to listen in Spanish or Portuguese, feel free. We will also be, we may be speaking in Portuguese and Spanish at some stage throughout this meeting. So if you don't speak one of those two languages and you'd like to listen to the webinar in English, just click on the English box as well. We welcome lots of interaction with the people that are listening to the webinar. Uh, for you to do that, please cl click on the Q&A box in Zoom. You'll see that again at the bottom of the screen. Click on there, provide your question. Uh, and throughout the webinar, we'll be picking up on those questions to explore what people are bringing to the discussion. If you do have any technical issues with translation, uh, please reach out to me uh, or to Ingrid. And uh, we will be recording the webinar and making that available later on. Uh, I see a colleague here has raised their hand. If you want to reach out to me individually, please feel free. So that's the practical information. Uh, I hope the translation is working well. And I'd like to hand over the very warm welcome to the RTRS Executive Director, Marcelo Visconti. Welcome, Marcelo. Thank you very much, James. Welcome, everybody. It's a pleasure to share this webinar with you today. I sincerely hope you are all faring well, keeping healthy and upbeat in these times of turmoil we are all facing. RTRS in its role of a global multi-stakeholder platform on soy, would like to open this webinar. The second of a series of six, which we launched last month and will continue through early 2021. The following questions aim to act as a springboard for discussion. What are soy connection factors? Why do they matter so to us all? From production to consumption, how can anyone in the value chain effectively use these conversion factors? What is their ultimate purpose? These are some of the matters we will be discussing with RTRS experts and partners today, but we are quite sure others will come up later. So let's briefly introduce the topic before ceding the floor to our experts. We are witnessing a historic moment, a milestone, a global consensus. Society as a whole is demanding transparency and urgent action to take proper care of our people and planet. Humankind is keenly aware of the sustainability of and social impact of soy production. However, soy is not often a visible component of the final product, neither is it directly used in the manufacturing process as its byproducts such as meal, oil, and lecithin are. It's not easy to quantify the total amount of soy used 
as an ingredient and even more challenging to realize that there is soy in our food. Participants in the value chain have devised strategies and tools to ensure the use of sustainable practices in their soy supply chain. RTRS has developed the conversion factor system and the soy footprint calculator as a means for players in the soybean sector, civil society, government bodies, and the public in general. So what do they do? They connect the processes involved in the use of soy from production to consumption. They enable users to follow the soy footprint in a rigorous, meticulous, and practical way informing the presence of soy oil, soy meal, soy hull, or soy pellet in animal feed or food products such as beef, chicken, milk, or eggs. This innovative tool will be active, frequently updating in order to respond to key information needs of their users. We are here today to invite you to become familiar with the advantages of the RTRS conversion factor system and the soy footprint calculator. They are the result of thorough research and technical work. So let's start the ball rolling. First and foremost, we are delighted to welcome our high level speakers and the organizations they represent. ProForest, Austral University, and 3Kill for helping us put into effect this ambitious project we are presenting today. We want to thank the individuals and organizations gathered here for their interest in joining us today. I would now like to turn the floor over to Jane Siqueira Lino, our moderator today. I am confident this will be a fruitful meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Marcelo, so much. Um, well, welcome everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening from wherever you're joining. Uh, my name is Jane. I work for ProForest and it's a pleasure to be here for this very important topic for many different stakeholders. Um, as part of ProForest, working with different organizations, different stakeholders that are interested in responsible sourcing and responsible production of different commodities, including soy, knowing where soy is present in different products and how much is present is a critical issue for all of them in different ways. For producers, um, even though it's not uh, who is actually today using the RTRS soy calculator, and I will explain why, it's super important to know uh, the soy, that the soy that they produce is going to be used in many different products and how much soy they need to produce in order to uh, be able to produce one ton of chocolate bars, for example. It's empowering for producers to know where the product that they produce is going to be used. For civil society, is also super useful because they are the key ones that can answer and can ask difficult questions such as how, what does it mean to have a lot or a little bit of soy in different products? How can we use this information to answer other questions such as what is the carbon, the footprint that is involved in the soy production? What is the water footprint that is involved and hopefully in the future, we'll be able to answer even deeper and more complicated questions, such as what is the social footprint of the soil that is being produced? And those are questions that are also part of consumers' concerns. They want to know more. They want to know what they are eating, what they are using on their faces and their houses, where they're sleeping on, and knowing that soy is present in so many different products, but more than anything else in what we eat, 
consumers want more and more to know where soy is present, how much of it is present, how much this represents, and what does that mean in terms of risks, in terms of opportunities, in terms of um, actions that can be supported to provide soy in a more sustainable way. And as we work a lot with supply chain companies, they are in the middle of all these different concerns and needs and need to meet them. So we need to be able to answer to civil society and consumers questions about what is uh, the soy that is being used, how much and what they can do to make sure that the soy is produced sustainably. And for that, the first question that company needs to answer is precisely what is, um, what is the soy footprint? And to calculate that, companies need to know how much soy, what are the products that contain soy in their supply chain, how much soy is contained in those products. And the RTRS calculator, which is available online and uh, uh, it will be part of, it's the main, um, the main star of our, of our discussion today. It's being updated mainly because um, of three different reasons. One is that it's a good practice to update and to be transparent on methodologies. Second, because it was important to include new items, new products that many different stakeholders are interested in knowing more about. And third, because it's also good to include different actors. So what we will be able to see is that now the new calculator allow different users to know how much soy is being produced and how much soy is being used in different uh, products. And by using this uh, calculator, companies, supply chain companies can make very important steps towards implementing their commitments. One of them is many companies have already been using the RTRS calculator to estimate how much soy is in the main products, what is their footprint, in order to buy certificates, RTRS credits, um, that would be a first step in trying to address the risks in their supply chain. But another, uh, another thing that companies can do with the soy footprint is prioritize. Looking at the different products they buy, looking which, understanding which of those have the most material soy footprint is important to prioritize for supply chain engagement, for a deeper understanding of their supply chain. So with that, I am really delighted to present to you what are the objectives, the speakers and the agenda of this webinar. Well, I hope you're all seeing my screen. Um, the objectives of this webinar is to present the soy footprint calculator and also its relevance for actors across the soy value chain. Another objective is to explain how the calculations are made and how conversion factors are established. And finally, engage with RTRS and broader soy community to support an understanding of the conversion factors and their relevance to responsible soy. So we really hope we can achieve those objectives through this webinar. And for that, we are counting with the great speakers that are going to talk to us today. We have Roberto Feni, a director from the Universidad Austral, and Will Schreiber from 3 Kiel. And um, the other point is the agenda. So we started with James opening the floor and talking a bit about this, how this webinar is part of a, 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 la a larger effort from RTRS to have a series of webinar that touches on very critical points to RTRS and RTRS community. Uh, we had Marcelo welcoming us all warmly, and then we'll have the presentation first from Universidad Austral, from Roberto, and then we'll have a quick um, interlude, a quick uh, intermission with uh, some, some questions. And then we'll have the second presentation from Will, from 3Q, and finally the real uh, discussions. And at the end, the, the wrap up with Marcelo again. So I'll take this slide to also 
remind you that you can uh, use the Q&A function in this Zoom webinar to put your questions. But even if you don't have a question, this is not a problem. You can vote on questions that are already there. And it will be great to see uh, the different questions coming and we'll try to answer them all. But of course, uh, this is just a, a starting point of a dialogue. So we will be able and we want to be able to, to answer to those questions even offline. So to warm up a little bit, I will stop sharing my screen and one on the chat, you will see that James has put a link um, and explanations on how you can use uh, a survey. And we would like to make it to ask you two very, very short questions. So one of the questions, if you, you can see on the chat that you can click on the link, it's, it should be very easy. You should just click on the link and be able to see the questions and answer. But you can also scan the QR code that you see on the screen or assess the www.slido.com and use hashtag conversion. And we have two questions there. One is really to understand your level of uh, knowledge about um, conversion factors. And we're seeing already some results on the screen, which is really, really exciting. Um, we're going to discuss the second question later on, which is about the use of RTRS conversion factors. But I'll give a couple seconds so everybody can, can really put their answers. Yeah, very good. So we see, oh, it's still moving, but we see that most of the people are in the middle. Not everybody's brave enough to say 10 and nine, but we have lots of six, seven and eights. Okay. Quite interesting. I think we can, yeah. It seems like a very good spread of people have a very little knowledge, which is fine and great. We are going to talk through uh, the conversion factors uh, in soy and uh, the presentations um, are, are going to, to really increase your knowledge for sure. And we also have a group of people that have a, a, fair, a, fairly, a very reasonable uh, level of knowledge on conversion factors, great. Yeah, thanks, James. So for the other question is, um, have you carried out a soy footprint using conversion factors? So 70% of people said no, 70, 71, and 29. So two thirds more or less haven't used the, the conversion factors yet. And a third more or less have uh, already. And this is great. We hope that with this webinar, you can uh, actually be able to say that you have used the conversion factors and that it was, uh, you have an increased knowledge in, in conversion factors for soy. So many thanks. And uh, with that, I'm sharing my screen again. To handover yeah i would just like to introduce you so just share quickly this slide um now we'll have the presentation from roberto feni he is director of the agribusiness and food center uh, sector in the australia university he's going to take us through the presentation of the conversion factors study from rhrs phase one so um, many thanks. Roberto, I'll stop sharing now and you should be able to share your screen, but welcome to, to this webinar. And please remember to use the Q&A um, session to put your questions. Well. I'm trying to set the presentation. Good, good morning, good evening, afternoon for everybody. My name is Roberto Fini from Australian University. I've been already introduced. 
I cannot put this in full screen, but uh, there's something that is not working. Um, I'm sorry, one minute. I don't know if I can follow on like this, but uh, I'm going to start like this. I, I cannot put it in full the presentation mode. Hello again, my name is Roberto Fini. Uh, I'm going to make a, a, a short explanation about the work we did for RTRS uh, regarding conversion factors. And uh, just as an introduction, we can say that uh, conversion factors are the amount of byproducts that we can obtain from a given amount of uh, soybeans. This is going to be further explained uh, in the second presentation. Uh, we all know the importance of uh, soybeans and uh, its most important characteristic that is a significant and cheap source of protein for animal uh, feed, but it's also important uh, ingredient for fo food products and raw material for biofuels and oil. Soybeans are uh, mainly used for industrial uh, crushing a process by which soya beans are transformed into into bioproducts. The main factors that uh, in the soya bean transformation product process that determine the, the yields are deficiency in the industrial process, the proper op operation management, and soya bean quality. Uh, while the two first factors, industrial process and proper operation management are uh, similar in most countries, soya bean quality is a differential factor that varies among uh, different regions and, and countries. Here we can see a slide of a, a big soya bean processing plant near Rosario, uh, city Argentina, one of the biggest in the world. Just in order to make an overview of the transformation process and to go to the conversion factors before we are going to start reviewing a very fast review of some facts regarding uh, soya beans. Soya beans, a soy bean is a plant of the pea or legume, legume family, best known legumes are peas, chickpeas, lentils and peanuts, but these plants have a distinctive characteristic that they form a pod as a fruit inside which the grains are housed. So uh, this is how a pod looks like, a green pod in the immature stage. The pod is a, has a broad, hairy, and flattened shape, about six to 10 centimeters long, and it can um, count up between one to uh, five seeds or beans, but the most common varieties have only, uh, let me see if I can put this in the full view, um, have between two and three. When, this, when the seed matures, it does not longer grow and the humidity, humidity de decreases uh, from to 13, 15%, that is the appropriate moisture level for harvesting. And this has its this brownish color. Here we see how uh, soya bean looks. Uh, it uh, has a round shape and features a small brown scar or helium, which is the mark after being released from the pod. The bean is mainly composed by two parts, the hull or the skin of the seed and the nucleus. The whole weighs around 7 to 8 percent of the total seed weight and then the, the nucleus contains the grain storage uh, tissues uh, in which uh, uh, the protein and oil is contained. And from here is where we're going to see uh, the, the transformation process but before we are going to have a glance on the structure of the soya bean cells where the oil uh, bodies and the soya bean storage vacuoles are, uh, uh, are uh, placed and from which uh, um, the transformation process will try to extract the oil and the, and the protein contained in these uh, structures. Now going to an overview to the soya bean process, we have a first industrialization which has uh, three principal steps reception, preparation, and extraction. 
Reception basically is the process of entering the soybeans into industrial crushing facility. This uh, stage includes grain delivery, sampling, weighing, and unloading first storage, pre-cleaning, and secondary storage. Preparation is basically preparing the, be the bean for oil extraction and meal production. It contains uh, different uh, stages, uh, steps such as conditioning in which uh, the moisture level is taken to an optimal level from 13% that is the reception uh, level of moisture to 10% which is the appropriate level for processing. Then there is a breaking and aspiration. Aspiration is the process by which the hull is separated from the, the core of, of, of the seed and then the core of the seed is broken into two, four, eight, and uh, 12 parts. The hull is uh, subjected to a process that is hull pelleting, by which uh, it's uh, shaped into small and elongated cavities, and uh, which improves significantly the handling and, tra and, and transportation features of, of, of the hull that is used for animal feed. Now the, the core of the seed is, is subjected to a process called flaking by which uh, the grain uh, is stretched and it gives it a, a greater volume in order to, um, to be a process. And there's an, 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 an last stage that is extrusion, extrusion that is not a required step but very common in the industry where the sheet that was obtained in the flaking stage is uh, further stretched uh, to, to obtain, um, to obtain a, 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 even a larger a, a flake. So the soya bean is, is prepared now uh, to um, enter to the third stage, third uh, step of the uh, industrialization process that is extraction in which oil and uh, meal are separated. Uh, in this process, there's a, a solvent that is used and uh, we obtain, on the one hand, a product that is called micella, that is a liquid that is a mixture of oil with, with the solvent. Normally, uh, we use, uh, the, the, the factory is used, um, that is, uh, that, um, that is some solvents, uh, but when, when we separate uh, the oil from the, from the meal, the, the oil is mixed up with solvent and the, and the, and the meal also has a, a solvent. So we have to, uh, through an evaporation process, separate the oil from the, from the solvent and we obtain crude oil, which is mixed up with, uh, with a product that is, is good, is called gums or um, it's a lipid or phospholipid, but it doesn't allow for good quality of oil. So this uh, gum or fofolipid has to be separated and is converted into a product that is called lecithin. After drying, we obtain here the gum, the crude oil and lecithin from the process that started with the mixture of oil with uh, solvent that is called micella. On the other side, we have the solid, solid material in which we have meal with solvent and through the process of desolventizing and toasting we, elim we, we uh, eliminate the, the solvent and the meal is dried and grained or crushed and we obtain two qualities of meal, high pro, a meal with high content of proteins and low content of fibers or low pro uh, meal with uh, less amount of protein and more uh, fiber. And, and uh, we also have the, the whole pellets that we already uh, mentioned before. So at the end of the first industrialization of soya beans, we obtain crude, the gum crude oil, lecithin, meal, and whole pellets. While most of these products are final products, uh, the, the gum oil is not used as a, as a final product, as going to be process in the second industrialization, that is what we're going to see now. In the second industrialization, the crude oil is uh, first passed through a process that is called a preparation and neutralization. Basically, we have to eliminate the oil acidity uh, 
produced by free uh, fat acid and they have to be removed. And once we pass through this process, um, we, can, um, we can obtain biodiesel or glycerol on the one hand or refined oil on the other. In order to obtain refined oil, the oil has to be, to, we have to improve the color of the, the, the crude oil. And we have to also eliminate others. And so bleaching and deodorization are two processes by which we eliminate the, 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 the other bad others and the, we improve the, the, the colors and we obtain refined oil for human consumption that it has very good nutritional uh, qualities. On the other hand, to obtain biodiesel and uh, glycerol, we have to pass through a chemical process that has a very strange name that is called transesterification. Basically, it's separate. we have to uh, separate the glycerol, which is an oil, from the fatty acids. And these fatty acids have to um, be combined with another alcohol that is called methanol. And we obtain a new structure, chemical structure that is called methyl ester. And this is what we call biodiesel. That is a fuel uh, that is a more, it, it contaminates less than the, the traditional diesel but it's, it's more expensive. And glycerol, that is uh, an alcohol that has many uses in the pharmaceutical and the food industry. So we have finished now the, the, the brief overview of all the stages of the first and second industrialization of soya beans. And now we are going to see which are the, the, the byproducts that we obtained in, in these uh, two industrialization process. As we saw, we have crude, go crude oil with gums. In order to improve the quality of the oil, we have to remove the gums that are called also phospholipids. They are lipids with phosphorus. They have very, uh, very interesting properties for the food industry. It's transformed into a product that is called lecithin. It, it has a property that's called emulsifying, by which we can mix um, Product, uh, compounds that they don't mix naturally for, for, for ingredients in, in bakery and chocolates and many other products. We obtain also high pro meal. This is meal for animal feed with high level of, of proteins between 47.5-49%. We also obtain whole pellets that also is used for uh, for uh, animal feed. The crude oil, the, the gum crude oil is further processed into, in, 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 into biodiesel or glycerol or refined oil. The biodiesel diesel is, is a fuel, glycerol as we said is used for the food and pharmaceutical industry and the refined oil is used as uh, uh, for, for human consumption. So having reviewed the, the different uh, by products that we can obtain in the first and second industrialization of soya beans, now we're going to look at the conversion factors. The conversion factors is the amount of byproducts that we can obtain from a certain uh, amount of soya bean beans that have been uh, received and processed through the first and second industrialization. And so that the, here we can, we can say that uh, with, if we want to obtain high pro meal and, uh, and whole pellets in the first in, 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 in industrial processing, from 100% of the soya being received and uh, processed, we obtain 20% of crude oil with gums. This uh, crude oil uh, with gums is um, open into, uh, when we take out the, 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 the gums, we transform them into lecithin we obtain 0.6% of lecithin and 19.4% of crude oil without gums. We obtain also 72% of high pro meal and 6.5% of whole pellets. In this first stage, there is uh, a loss of, um, of, of, of raw material of 1.5%. Basically, it's uh, 
it uh, consists in, in the removal of foreign material like plastics, dust, metal, metal wood, and water. In the process of transforming uh, the soya bean, we need to uh, dry the soya bean and moisture is, uh, is, is lost in, the, in that process. So uh, once we obtain 20% of crude oil that is open into uh, the gum, crude oil 19.4 plus uh, 0.6 of lecithin, high pre pro meal 72%, and 6.5% of whole pellets. I, when we explained what a soya bean was, we said that the whole or the skin weighs between seven to eight percent of the seed weight, but one percent is, 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 is lost. That means that we obtain between six and seven percent of the total weight of seed in holes. So we move to the second, uh, the second uh, industrialization, the second process by which there's a first, uh, there's a first uh, 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 stage where uh, the, 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 this crude oil has to be prepared and there is a loss of 2% in the naturalization, in, 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 the, in the process we explained before, that is a neutralization. So out of, uh, out of the 19.4% that we receive in, the, in, in this second stage, we're going to uh, subtract 2% uh, and we finally will obtain 15.7% of biodiesel and 1.7% of diesel oil. Or if we go to, uh, to refined oil for human consumption, consumption uh, out of this 19.4%, there's a loss of 2.3. There's an extra 0.3% that we lose in the process of eliminating others and improving colors in the bleaching and the deodorization process. So finally, we obtain 17.1% of refined, refined oil. If we do the same conversion factors, but now instead of have, having high pro meal and, and whole pellets, we mix the meal with the pellets um, and we obtain low pro meal. That is a meal that is more suitable to, uh, to feed uh, ruminant animals like bovines, because it has more, more fiber, but it has, on the, on the other hand, has less amount of proteins, and we obtain 78.5%. All the other numbers are exactly the same. All the conversion factors are the same as we saw in the, in the, the previous slide. Now we are going to make a, a, a turn and we are going to look to the same uh, conversion factors, but in a different format. Here, what we are seeing is the amount of tons of soya bean that we have to receive in order to get one ton of uh, different byproducts. So th this means if, for example, we want to um, transform um, uh, the soya beans into lecithin, uh, to obtain one ton of lecithin, we need 166.67 tons of soya beans. If we want to obtain one ton of biodiesel, we need uh, 6.37 tons of, of soya bean. And in the case of glycerol, we, if we want one ton of, so, uh, of glycerol, we would need 58.82 uh, tons of soya beans. So these uh, are the results of the conversion factors. Uh, they're international average values, depending especially on the different composition of oil and protein presented in, in various uh, regions and countries. Uh, these are estimated benchmarks uh, we obtained from interviews with academic experts, industrial chambers, soybean managers and equipment uh, manufacturers. They are consistent uh, with the international literature. So here I am, I, I, I finished and I thank you and we're open for questions afterwards. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Roberto. Uh, it's a great presentation and also very good timing. Um, we're going to have uh, the questions. I see some questions starting to come in the Q&A. 
um, and uh, we'll have a moment for discussions at the end of the of the webinar. And just to remind everybody that uh, in the chat there is a link to the presentation. So presentations are available if you have any trouble in um, seeing the images on, on the screen. You can access the presentation through the link. Um, so I would ask uh, James if you can uh, pull up again the results from the survey that we did uh, at the beginning so we can see the final uh, results and uh, and yeah so interestingly there there is a, a percentage that has uh, no uh, knowledge yet about conversion factors and then most of the people are distributed again the the middle uh, numbers like a, an average uh, an average knowledge about conversion factors and then this is the the final results with 16 63 people responding that's uh that's uh, great oh it's still changing so some people are still voting that's not a problem at all and then for the next question about using conversion factors yeah so still at uh, two-thirds a little bit more that haven't uh, used yet uh, the conversion factors, which is also interesting. And I would like to take this as, a, as an opportunity and before Will's presentation also to show how is the, the current RTRS calculator that we are talking about and that this webinar is about. So if I share my screen, you can see in RTRS website, we have um, here, at the RTRS soy, you can click. So this is how it is available right now. The new soy calculator is not on the website yet. So this is really to show you how it has been available so far. So here you can see this um, text about calculating your soy footprint and you can access the calculator. And it is as simple as that. There are a couple of instructions, but it's really straightforward. So today, what we have is a number, a list of products that a company or even a consumer can calculate their own footprint, imagining how much meat and cheese and eggs and milk they, they eat um, in a month and calculating their soy footprint, for example. So all as uh, someone, uh, anybody can do is to include some numbers here. So just put really random numbers. Someone that eats lots of cheese. And then we can calculate the soy footprint. And it shows the total footprint and the distribution. So if we change numbers, we can see a distribution across the different products. And this is based on a very simple conversion factor that we can see right here on the screen. So basically, it's a, it's a factor that multiplies the, the kilograms of product. And this, as I mentioned uh, at the beginning, it's been the focus of, the, of these two studies, first with the Universidad Austral and uh, the second with the uh, 3Kill. And Will is going to show us uh, now how the new calculator is going to work. So with that, I will hand over to Will, who is um, who is going to to show us and share his um, screen to show us uh, the the second phase of this study by um, RTRS. So the floor is yours, Will. Great. Okay, thanks, Yanni. And that was a great introduction, and, and it's always good to be following um, somebody who's, who's done quite a lot of the technical academic research on, on how a soybean actually makes it into your various products. What we'll be talking about for the next 20 minutes and showing you is just how it is that we've used studies like that um, to recommend factors to RTRS to refine the um, conversion factor calculator. So with that, I will um, continue to give you a bit of a background of just ourselves and, and how it is that we approached this before we, we looked at the process we went through and selecting the appropriate factors and developing the calculation model um, and then showing you through, through a preview of the forthcoming uh, calculator that will be replacing the one that Yana just showed you on the current RTRS website. 
As, as far as 3QL goes, we're, we're Oxford UK based sustainability advisors, and we work with businesses and policymakers and nonprofit organizations like RTRS um, on food and consumer goods. As a business, we, we exist to create a better future for people in the environment, um, and we work through you know, ideas and evidence and bringing people together. So um, if you have ever worked with us before, I hope you'll find that we're quite friendly people and curious and practical in, in dealing with these quite complex challenges in understanding how um, your soy footprint is, is calculated and um, can be addressed from a sustainability uh, perspective. This all works in one of our practice areas of sustainable commodities, um, of which we have a few different areas um, that we, we work in, one of which is, is through um, the supply chain assessment bits where we've engaged with hundreds of companies in the soy supply chain uh, to understand their soy footprint and where the soy that's being used is coming from, um, as well as working with organizations on deforestation strategies and other bespoke analyses. Uh, if you worked with us before, it's probably been through either our work on engaging the supply chain um, or because we we're also the representatives for the retail soy group. Um, or perhaps you are uh, a trader or soy producer and have been working with us through the Soy Transparency Coalition. Um, as part of the supply chain work, uh, for the last two years, we've engaged hundreds of, of companies that are involved um, up the retail supply chain. So going back to livestock producers, feed manufacturers, um, food manufacturers, to understand how much soy is present within in, in food products. And one of the big challenges with that is that most people that we speak with aren't often familiar with the amount of soy that's being used. So out of the 500 companies that we engaged with earlier this year, um, for example, in the latest reporting for, for 2019, only 20% or one in five were able to have any uh, direct knowledge of the amount of soy that was included within the products that they were supplying ultimately to a retailer, uh, which might've been because they were a livestock producer themselves or it might have been that they've been able to engage with um, the, the actual producers or the feed manufacturers to understand the, the quantity of soy that's present. Um, and because there's different types of organizations that, that you might represent as well, you, you could be a retailer or an ingredient user, so you're just buying some um, mayonnaise from, from somebody else, um, or perhaps you're growing a chicken, um, or you're just buying in pork. We, we understand that, and, and RTS understood, that many people aren't able to get this information. And the use of conversion factors is, is a really critical part in plugging that gap so that you can understand what your exposure is and, and how you can go about addressing um, those deforestation risks. Um, sometimes that, that involves working with, with traders, which is why we're also involved with the Soy Transparency Coalition, um, which is just recognizing that there's lots of producers, very few traders, and then many companies uh, like yourselves that, that you could be in terms of understanding um, how soy is actually being used but understanding that starting point of how much soy is present in your supply chain is really critical to being able to, to take any action. So in terms of how it is that we went about selecting factors, um, we, 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 did, we kind of launched straight into, here's a calculator, here's what we can look at in terms of soy quantities. We think it's always good just to reframe as to why it is that somebody would use a conversion factor and, and what one actually is. And, and the key principle to that is that many organizations or civic society um, policymakers, they are not actually buying soy, they're not producing soy, they're looking at exposure, they're looking at risk, um, and the need is, is to align the information that they have or that you have for your organization or research and convert that into something that makes sense if you're trying to understand the amount of soy that's present. Um, or the amount of hectares of land that are being used, or the degree of deforestation risk that might be present in your supply chain. So any conversion factor is, is principally that you're taking a value that you know, and you're multiplying it by another value to find out what you would like to know. So if you know how much beef you have, or how much um, milk you have in this case, you would be able to then convert that into how much soy was required in order to produce that milk from the animal feed um, that was ultimately embodying that soy. Um, so, so many companies that we would speak with, we might engage with to say, we need to know about the, the soy that's present in the milk um, from, from the animal's feed. And they would respond to say, well, we don't do soy milk. We don't have soy as an additive, it's just cow's milk. And, and that's exactly the point. 
is, is that the cow is eating soy as part of its feed mix. And that is the bit of information that you would need to know if you're trying to understand how much soy is actually present. But many people don't necessarily understand the, those connections, and that's really where conversion factors come into play. So RTRS approached us earlier in the year, uh, well, last year actually, um, to recommend and review existing current conversion factors that are available in the world for feed and food products um, that would be applicable for companies regardless of where they are in the world, regardless of um, the specific production system they're a part of. And in doing that, we had to take account of um, several issues. So one of which is that the factor needed to be applicable for everyone. It, it wouldn't be enough just to say you're an Argentinian um, producer of chicken or a French producer of chicken. It's one factor that everybody is able to, to use. So how is it that we could find something that would be globally applicable? The calculator itself needs to be really simple. So um, although you can have multiple steps and inputs that would go into a process, um, the desire was to have something that was similar to what is already used in the calculator, which RTRS was told was the most helpful. You have a single value that you enter, how much chicken do you have, for example, and you find out how much soy is present. Um, we need to understand that there are production systems and feed rations. Uh, so if you have an organic chicken or a free range chicken um, or a um, indoor bred chicken, they're gonna eat different amounts of food um, and they have different lifespans. And we have to look at what those issues are in determining whether or not uh, a factor would be able to satisfy all these other conditions. Um, and, and principally, the people who are using factors, it's often that you're in that 75% or 80% of organizations that don't have visibility of, of how much soy is being used in your supply chain. Um, so the people who are actually using the tool often have the limited, the most limited visibility. Whereas if you were a feed manufacturer, you, you probably would know how much soy is being used, but your interest might be that you're buying soy oil or you're buying soy hulls and you'd like to know how many soybeans are actually uh, required in order to produce that quantity. Um, recognizing that the RTRS factors are cited by a, a range of policymakers, researchers, institutions, companies in doing their own soy footprint, um, there needed to be a high degree of transparency in how these factors were selected um, and put forward. Um, and, and then principally tying everything together to, to soybean equivalents, uh, which is slightly different from how the current um, calculator is showing things it allows you to make those conversions to the actual demand uh, for, for the soybean. So as we have uh, kind of alluded to already, there are many different ways that one can try to find out what conversions are needed in order to estimate a soy footprint. Um, there are academic studies that, that, have, uh, that exist in the world that might break them down by country. Um, there might be some consolidated um, toolkits like what ProFerris recently released for the soy toolkit, uh, where they show a few different studies, including RTRS, to say, well, what are the different conversion factors? Um, and this variability is, is an intrinsic aspect of deciding what you're going to use, simply on the basis of there are lots of different systems that are at work. But you can see with WWF, for example, at the bottom, people will take those single values in order to understand their exposure or their particular um, degree of, uh, of, of presence of a particular commodity so that they can do further work to understand where the challenges actually are in delivering a more sustainable system. So our process in doing this was to identify which sources would be the most appropriate uh, to use in, in recommending these factors to, to RTRS, um, reviewing the quality of, of what came, uh, of, of what has come through from all of those various studies, and doing that in a systematic way so that we could be transparent in terms of how the factors have been so selected. And although the variability of some of these production systems around the world are considered, only single factors are being produced in order to achieve the, the requirements of having that, that really simple tool that you'll be able to use in a moment. Um, in terms of whether, how many studies we, we were looking at, there were uh, effectively a few that started to cross-reference cross, source, cross each other. Um, so you can see here that um, although there are several studies that are being used, they might have different methods, but then those methods would then become outputs to something else. So you might have studies from WWF and, and the likes that are using soy factors, but they might be reliant upon another study to do that. So we had to go back to the source to make sure that they were actually unique calculations and approaches um, that we would then be reviewing. 
all of the quality that we assessed was, was looking around six different areas of consideration. Um, the transparency and how it is they did the calculations to, to work out those conversions, how reliable is the method that they used, um, have they used authoritative sources, so have they worked with producers, are they using national and international data sets, um, what relevance is this for a global factor as opposed to a really good small scale farm factor but is completely unrepresentative of, of what you might be using in your supply chain, um, how it is that they're um, being recognized and attributed in other people's work. So are the likes of the soy toolkit uh, from ProForest or WWF, um, are any of the round tables dealing with soy, are they referencing this type of material, which shows that there's a degree of credibility um, for, for what's being applied, um, as well as the range of proteins that are being used as well, because we're looking at lots of different factors. So we're trying to find ones that are gonna be the most appropriate uh, across a range of them. Now, once the new calculator launches, you'll have a technical document that's gonna be uh, available publicly as well, where you'll be able to see a one, one and a half page summary on each of the sources that we reviewed, um, as well as um, the uh, specific conversion factors that they've applied, a description of their method, um, as well as a, a, an interpretation of the applicability for, for RTRS. So this is a fully transparent process that, that we've undertaken and then um, shown in, in producing the, these types of factors. So what we'll be looking at in a moment when we get to the calculator is that the factors that have been selected address a few different um, views, one of which is for feed. So this would be um, a company that perhaps is a livestock producer um, or the data set that you have for the feed industry is you know how much uh, feed you're using for, for beef, um, but you don't necessarily know the soy content within that beef or the, the different types of soy, whether it's holes, um, or oils or, or meal that, that's gone into it. There's a range of conversion factors just for you. Whereas for those that are um, looking for conversion factors for food, um, there's a few other options for you, which is now it's gonna be for the type of company who's buying chicken, who's buying cheese, who's buying beef. Um, and, and from that basis, there's a different conversion factor, which again will be split by the different types of uh, soy co-products and the associated um, demand for them. You'll, you'll note a moment ago that it said retail weight um, up there before because we've provided a few different ways in the calculation model to make it relevant to the information that you have. Because ultimately for the calculator, that's what we would like to get to, is it's not something that would take you three weeks within your business to work out how it is that you'd even be able to start using the calculator. It's using the simplest information available to get you a, um, a soy footprint. So the second ask that, that RTRS gave us was to develop a fair way of ensuring that the soy supply needs are connected to, to the product demand. Um, and if we think back, what was only 10 minutes ago or 15 minutes ago on this from Roberto um, in defining how it is that we can see where the various co-products of soybeans are being used and, and how much of them are being used, um, effectively what that creates is, is a demand type picture that shows that you may need more soybeans in order to get an equivalent level of what you're actually buying, whether that's soy oil um, or soy meal or, or hulls. Um, and therefore the calculator needs to take account of that if you're trying to then convert that into the soybean equivalent. Now, for some in the industry, and it's not just soy for, for this, this is any commodity, any, anything that you're buying where there's uh, something that you don't want yourself that, that's in the process, you get what's called a byproduct. So if you were a feed manufacturer um, and you wanted high pro meal uh, from, from the crushing facility, you would say, well, the crude oil and the pellets, we don't need those. So those are byproducts. However, somebody else actually wants those. So, and they have an economic value associated with them. So, so rather than calling them byproducts, we would call them co-products because they're additional um, materials that are coming from, from the soybean. And it's the same thing with lecithin. With Roberto, he showed that you needed 166 tons of soybeans in order to get one ton of lecithin, it doesn't mean that the other 165 tons of soybean material is just waste and has no footprint associated with it. You still needed those soybeans. But it's uh, not appropriate necessarily to think that you needed all of that just for your supply when there is economic value associated with all of the other materials that have been produced. So the question was, how is it that we can ensure that the buyers of RTR certified soy um, are able to effectively pay for 
uh, the, the amount of material that they're being used. And we do this using something called economic allocation, which is very common in, in life cycle assessment approaches. And with that, what we look at is the value of the various materials to work out the appropriate demand um, that you would have in, um, in, in soybean production. So instead of needing 166 tons of uh, soybeans for, for less of them, it's saying if you use 2.47, so about two and a half tons, you're gonna get that one ton of lecithin accounting for all of the other co-products that would be produced along the way. So this is the most widely used approach. It, it gives you a good connection to what the producer actually needs to satisfy uh, your demand. Um, and if you're gonna be buying RTRS credits, then that credit value can be based on the economic benefit of, of the product. Um, and because it's using a valuation method of saying, well, what are each of these materials work in the marketplace? Um, the co-products are, are being priced according to where the demand actually is. So if you're looking at a chicken, effectively what the calculator is going to be doing is splitting out between the different types of soy co-products that are going into that chicken um, and applying a conversion factor, which will then be converted into the soybean equivalent to work out the amount of soybeans that are actually needed. And again, all of this will show you in the calculator as, as being transparently done. Now the calculator itself is going to be made available in two different ways. You'll have it on the website um, for, for RTRS once it's integrated, and I'll give you a preview of that in just a moment. Um, and then you'll also be able to have an Excel tool, which will provide you with the ability uh, to work offline. So you're not entering in anything on the website and you've got a, a spreadsheet that you can send on to others. The two calculators are identical in both their function as well as in their reporting. Um, and they allow you to look at any food products like we've talked about, chicken, beef, cheese, milk, um, the feed, so your dairy cattle, poultry production, or indeed the soy itself. So if you're looking at um, the soybean demand, again, for, for lecithin, that's all present within the calculator too. It is a very simple calculator. You enter everything on a single line. You can select the units. You have an additional option for, for direct conversion of oil meal and whole to soybeans, as I've said. So if that's what you have, that's what you can see. Um, those calculations are for the world. There's, there's not much variability that you're able to, um, to get lost in because it's just a very simple approach. And therefore you have greater consistency for the users. It's also quite flexible because you can either do a single product assessment or just a kilogram of, of beef or you can do your whole product portfolio if you've worked out those figures, um, or, or indeed if, if you're looking at, uh, at an economy level for all of the beef that's come into um, Switzerland, you would be able to, to pull those figures in too. The factor visibility is still shown as it is in the current calculator, so you can do your own um, calculations offline or in any other systems that you're already using. Um, and we present two different ways of, of showing those results. And for that, I'm just going to now stop and share my screen um, with the calculator itself. So it'll just take a moment while we do that swap here. Um, and this is not how the calculator will look in the end once it's on the RTRS website. Um, this is just the, the building space as it gets integrated into that. So the fonts and everything will work out for you. Um, but as you're looking around at the page, what you'll see is that we're, the calculator is gonna be made available in three different languages to start with. You have English, as is shown on this page, uh, we have Spanish, and we have Portuguese. Um, so on the RTRS system, it won't be different tabs that you would have, it would just be one tab um, that you would be using, and then you'd be able to select the relevant language um, that you would like to, to apply. When you first come to it, you'll see your table over here on the left, which is similar to the current RTS calculator, where you'll be able to enter in um, the amount of um, material that you're using. So uh, um, if we're buying in 60 tons of fish um, or indeed 1500 tons of chicken, we can do that for food. You can have options over here in terms of changing between the unit of measure. So the beef can actually be in kilograms or into pounds um, so that you have that, um, again, relevance to your own input data. And for food products, you can select whether it's retail weight or carcass weight, depending upon where you are uh, in the supply chain. So as we can go down, you can see all of the different food products in here that you would be able to enter values for. You can also enter it for animal feed, again, um, selecting the units as appropriate. Um, and finally, you have the soy products themselves. So if you're looking at high pro soy meal, low pro soy meal, the whole soy hull or the soy lecithin, 
um, you would be able to enter in those types of values too. As you go down the page, you just press soy print, and this will then show you two different outputs. On the top, you have the soybean equivalent for using the economic allocation approach I've discussed. Again, this is talking about, and we provide this as an example up here, the amount of tons of soybeans that are required, considering all of the different co-products that might be coming from those um, soybeans. Um, and we have examples for that before, then splits it out by the different types of, um, of products that you have, as well as by the different um, co-products of, of the soybean itself. However, there is also the opportunity um, to view the soybean equivalent based on demand allocation, which is going back to Roberto's analysis, is if you're looking at the pure basic principle of how many soybeans do I need to get a ton of lecithin, that's where you get your 166 tons. Um, and that type of analysis is present on here for you too, so that you can see what would be relevant for um, your research um, or your supply chain or, or for your um, economy, uh, depending on where you're looking at doing the analysis. So both of them provide the exact same outputs in terms of breaking down um, where the soy is being used. And you can click down here for a detailed breakdown, which then splits it out using the specific numbers um, as well. And if you want to change anything, you can just go in here and um, alter the numbers and just click soy footprint again, and it'll redo it for you. Or you can press clear and it gets rid of everything. Once you have your whole um, footprint, so if we pop these guys in here too, you can then save it, not on the web, but by clicking to download your results. And when you do that, what it will provide you with is a PDF um, that gives you um, everything that you've entered in the tool um, as a download. So you've got your full footprint for the economic and the demand allocation, um, and then you have a detailed analysis split by each of the different types um, so that you can add everything together yourself. So if we just look at one other view of that, which is just gonna be the Excel calculator, you can see it does exactly the same thing. So for the Excel soy calculator, um, there's an introduction that you'll be able to apply. So I just need to move that around so I can move my mouse to this. On the soy calculator, again, it looks exactly the same. So you've got your various weight that you can enter. Um, only this happens live as you're going through it. Um, and that will then show you your results for both the soybean equivalent for the economic allocation as well as the demand allocation um, for further down below. If you wanted to change these to kilograms, it will adjust the calculation for you um, as you go across the page. Um, and similarly, you can then click for your detailed breakdown, um, looking at both the economic allocation as, as well as the demand allocation. And the conversion factors that are applied um, are provided on the last page and here for conversion factors. So that's a brief overview of the uh, different ways that you'll be able to use the calculator once it launches on the RTRS website. Um, there is guidance that's built into the tool as well that will take you through a step-by-step -step practice process on the website uh, should you um, not know where to start. It will show you everything and provide that interpretation um, in English, Spanish, and Portuguese. So that's... Um, me a couple minutes over, uh, but that's, uh, yeah, uh, very much open to questions and, um, and comments at this stage. I'll hand it back to Yane. Many thanks, Will. And uh, yeah, it's really, it's really great to see both presentations and how it brings together um, at least three aspects that we can see throughout the development of the, the update of the, the calculator and the conversion factors, which is it's science-based. So you see a lot of research that is behind the development of those uh, conversion factors from the beginning, from the soy bean pod until the very end uh, where we can see the cheese and the, the chocolate bar. Um, another point is that it's very transparent, even in terms of methodology. So all documents, reports, uh, reviews, uh, literature reviews will be available for anybody that wants to check. And uh, at the end, of course, user friendly. So it needs to be used, it needs to be used uh, by people and people need to be able to understand on their own. So it's uh, great to see those two presentations. Before starting with the questions, I would just like to tell you that James is going to paste on the chat a link to a survey 
uh, which is basically to to evaluate this webinar so it's very quick uh, we really encourage you to click on the link and answer those few questions it will be very useful for for RTRS to plan for the next webinars to understand how this has been useful for all of you and Starting and also another reminder is that the presentations are available in the link that James also pasted in the chat a while ago and uh, James again if you can paste it again as well for the for whoever wants to have the the presentation that will also be great. So on the questions we have uh, lots of very, very interesting questions uh, and as I mentioned before, you can vote on the questions that you think are more important. We won't be able to answer them all, so really need to prioritize and try to aggregate here some of them. Uh, so I will start by one question that I think will be, um, it will be good to hear from Will and from Roberto, which is about the differences among the, the countries and the regional differences in soy um, the, the the process of um, soy and how much uh, it, it really varies and how the calculators and the conversion factors accounted for those differences if it's just an average or if uh, it's applicable to different regions if uh, the user can choose the region where they are this came from James, Aske, Pauline and the, probably a couple of others I'm just going through the Q&A so if we can um, start with Roberto um, about the regional differences, and then we can hand over to Will. Yes, uh, the yields are determined, as I explained, by, by the efficiency in the industrial process, by the operation management, but especially by uh, the fact of, uh, that soya beans have different quality in terms of oil and protein content uh, in different regions and different uh, uh, countries. Basically, there are environmental, genetic, and crop management factors that make makes that the content of oil and uh, proteins are different in different in, in different countries. So environmental factors just uh, such as temperature, water, latitude, light, nitrogen availability are all those factors are, are going to influence the amount of oil and, 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 and protein obtained. The genetics of the seeds, the seed varieties used uh, the, the, according to the plant breeding programs that uh, seeding, seed companies uh, use, um, normally they stress more in the amount of, of, uh, of soya bean uh, production in terms of uh, total weight uh, and tonnage. Uh, they obtain more than the amount of protein and uh, protein content, um, oil and protein content. So, um, the genetics, the type of seeds that are used also influence in the amount of oil and, and protein. And finally, management, uh, crop management factors so, such as the sowing uh, the, the date um, and the maturity groups are also very important and, and the crop management, uh, all the practice, agricultural practice, practices that farmers use, all that influences and uh, really we can we, they're very different, uh, the, 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 the soya bean quality in different countries. For, for example, uh, a protein, the soya bean protein from, a, a, from Brazil will have much more, the, the soya bean in Brazil will have much more protein that, for example, Argentina, that Argentine soya bean has more content of oil and less content of uh, protein. Um, the soybeans from the U.S. generally has also less content than Brazil or China, but more than, than Argentina. So all those factors are going to influence uh, the soy bean quality in terms of uh, oil and uh, protein content. Uh, what we made at an average value, uh, international uh, um, uh, value, but um, it differs in, in, in each country. Thank you, Roberto. Uh, Will, do you want to compliment? Um, yes, so I get the, the lovely job of saying that that's something that's very transparent in the studies that we have would have used in terms of the different approaches. Um, but 3 kill didn't actually create new factors for this. And that's one of the aspects that makes this a really open process 
uh, for you to be able to understand some of these aspects. But what we looked for are studies that took the appropriate considerations that Roberto had uh, for conversion into foodstuffs um, and, and feed into account uh, in deciding whether or not the factor was most appropriate. But as, as the question indicates, there are, are a few different ways that can do it. And certainly, as Roberto said, there's lots of variability. Um, and our role was, was simply selecting the ones of existing studies that, that had already taken place that were publicly available and transparently saying how it is that we selected uh, what would be most appropriate. So it's a very appropriate question. It's very relevant. And I'm very pleased to be able to say that um, we didn't actually make a decision uh, on all the technical aspects on that. What we did is a systematic way of reviewing what should be considered in light of the assumptions that original study authors took in, in coming to those points. Great, perfect. Thanks. And another question that also um, appeared a couple times from different people and it was um, briefly responded in the chat but I think it would be good uh, maybe well if you can uh, develop more on that is about other products so from a consumer perspective if it would be a consumer would be able to calculate their soy footprint in consuming uh, vegan products uh, vegetarian products and also animal-based uh, products yeah uh, it, it is funny when 90% of the soy that's used is going into animal feed, and, and of course there's, there's a lot of interest in, in vegetarians <laughs> and vegans, and, and I think that the uh, vegan food, sorry, not vegans as people, um, and um, one thing that RTRS has been, been keen to emphasize is this is um, a starting point as opposed to an end point for the calculator, and if there are requests for other factors to be used, um, other languages, etc., uh, I think it's just that you need to email RTRS and let them know that you're interested in that, and then they can look at, at populating and, and expanding the calculator so that it's more widely relevant to other materials. Um, I, I, I can't comment on the specific ones that they had suggested that we include to begin with, um, but there is certainly a process of um, continual review and improvement. So if there are those requests, I would say send them to RTRS and they can look at incorporating them. Perfect. Um, another one that was also, uh, I think it is, uh, it would be good to hear from both of you. It's about the losses in the process. How would those uh, um, included in the calculations? So since the beginning from the soy being till the, the soybean oil, lecithin and so on, but also in the, in the animal um, supply chain. So I don't know, Roberto, if you, if you would be able to start. Yes, well, um, we tried to, uh, to define explicitly how much raw material is lost uh, during the soybean processing, first and second processing. And um, again, this is an average uh, uh, loss of raw material uh, during, as, as I explained, uh, for matter that has to be removed or what, especially moisture that is lost during the process due to the fact that soya beans have to be dried or heated. Uh, so again, uh, the, 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 the figures that we, we, we put uh, are a result of our interviews uh, with uh, managers in different uh, factories in Argentina, Brazil, and the US. And uh, that is the material that is lost and is not uh, going to be um, uh, used to produce any byproduct. So the losses are what you lose in the, in, 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 in the processing uh, uh, of, of the soya beans and are not going to be, be included into uh, the byproducts. Uh, the losses are really very small because the industry is very efficient and they try to reuse many of um, the, 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 the materials that are, uh, or they, they try not to eliminate anything, but only those things that are not appropriate to, 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 to process. And they also minimize the, the, the loss of water. But in spite of that, there, is, there are small uh, losses, as I said, 1.5 in the first industrialization and between two and 2.3 in the second industrialization. Uh, but that is not counted into the byproducts. Perfect, thanks, Roberto. Will? Uh, I get to revert back to my previous answer as well, which is that losses were considered um, as part of the review uh, in, in whether or not a study was appropriate for that. But the individual approaches to that would be different. But the, 
it, we weren't starting from the basis of um, of a single supply chain. So, so we have visibility from from some of the other work that we do in terms of how this is is working in practice and the, and the variations that I referred to between different types of production systems and origins and everything else. We're looking for a global factor, and the studies that we were looking at for appropriateness for RTRS. Um, of course, would need to consider those types of aspects at a system level. So what is actually needed to produce a ton of chicken, whether it's a retail weight, you know, a fillet that's sitting on the shelf, um, or a carcass weight that you're handling at a slaughterhouse. Um, those were the things that we were interested in, making sure that the approaches that were undertaken by the study authors were appropriate in dealing with those types of challenges. <coughs> Excuse me. So the, the main point is that with the calculator, you should be able to use it. All of those aspects should be considered already in the selection of the factor that's gone into it. So you shouldn't need to do a further adjustment unless you're doing something else as well. So if you were making a, um, uh, let's say a cheese and bacon sandwich or, or something, you might have two different inputs from that. So you would need to have your cheese footprint and your bacon footprint, which you could put both into the calculator and that would give you the output for that if, if, a, if a consumer or a household was, was interested in, in doing that. Um, but what you wouldn't need to do is then look for, for something else to put into it, unless perhaps it was uh, some vegetarian cheese that was made from soy, uh, in which case you, you would have some other input that would go into it. But if it was just the chicken itself that should incorporate everything in the system from, from rearing the chicken um, through, through to the weight that's, uh, up, that you select when you enter it into the calculator. Thanks. And uh, well, I also see, and uh, I don't know if uh, everybody can see that uh, Roberto was also answering some of the, the questions in the chat. Um, there is another one that I would like to, I think we still have time for maybe one or two, um, that was uh, voted quite a lot. Um, and I think this one, um, it's more for you, Will, but Roberto, feel free to add to that. It's really about what is, um, what is the real need for soy footprint calculation and how can this be connected to deforestation risk and uh, so it's if you can elaborate I think from from your experience with companies as well this would be very helpful for for other people to understand sure so um, I guess first and foremost it's the most basic question that any company would be asked um, in, in that or whether whether your company or an NGO or your government body that's looking to understand exposure and, and currently in the EU there's um, emerging due diligence requirements on um, deforestation free products and in the UK, they're, they're um, currently out to consultation on, on a similar type of initiative. And for any company that's looking at doing due diligence, the first question that you'd be able to need to respond to is, well, how much soy is actually present um, for, for this particular commodity? Um, for an NGO that's trying to look to see what companies' actions are, are doing to address deforestation, they would say, well, how much soy is actually being used? Where is it coming from? Um, so in order to answer that, that very first question, knowing your starting point is, is really important. Uh, so the people that we tend to see using conversion factors already are those that have deforestation free strategies. And that would certainly be, I, I think, one of the, the basic principles for that. Um, but it's also looking at supply chain risk um, as, as well. So as there's trade wars and, and that affects commodity flows um, and you've got coronavirus affecting trade flows as, as well, knowing how much your exposure is, where it's present within your products and supply chain, um, you know that if you hear that there's a fire in a port somewhere, is that at all relevant to, to, to your business and which products would be affected by it? Well, if you know that soy is going into them and you know that most of your soy is going into your chicken or your pork um, at a trade level or at a company level or just as you as a householder, you might be able to see and make, and make relevance to that information. What happens if the price of soy triples? Um, how can you respond as an organization um, or or a policymaker to that type of situation if you don't understand what the starting point is for it. So the idea with conversion factors is it provides you with the easiest gateway to understanding that type of exposure and risk. Um, it's not the end point, and that's why for, for many it's about engagement, but you can uh, prioritize where that takes place. So if soy is present indirectly, it doesn't say it on the product label, doesn't necessarily even say it on the feed. Feed manufacturers might have that as a proprietary mix. Um, understanding what your starting point is, is is really fundamental to any type of strategy, whether it's deforestation um, or, or broader risk mitigation. Perfect, many thanks. And uh, Roberto, see that one of the questions you answered in the chat, but not sure if everybody could see, so it would be good to hear you um, about that as well, was about the 
the different uh, the calculators the calculation for the oh wait a minute we have more questions being voted my god so okay we won't be able to answer them all um, but yeah for Roberto I think the the question would be the differences between um, high and low protein uh, if there is a strong difference the, between the different markets so who's using low protein high protein soy and also in terms of the countries the producing countries if there is a different characteristic in Argentina and Brazil that will say this avenue is more explored by this uh, country or another yes Low pro, uh, well, let's start with high pro uh, meal is used for uh, monogastric uh, animals such as poultry and, and pigs. Um, most of the soya bean is produced for high pro uh, meal. But also there's a market for the low pro meal. Uh, low pro meal has more, more fiber as the hull or the, or the skin of the, of the seed goes, goes into, into, the, into the meal. And this, that uh, type of meal is more appropriate for, um, for ruminant animals, such as uh, bovines, among them cattle. But most of the soya bean that, that, that is uh, transformed, especially in Argentina, Brazil, and the, the US is for the high pro uh, meal. Perfect. Many thanks, Roberto. I think with that, we really need to wrap up in order to finish in time. I know everybody has many other commitments. Um, so thank you so much, Will and Roberto, for the presentation and the questions. Thank you, everybody, for being uh, putting so many interesting questions. We didn't have time to go through them all, but I'm sure we can follow up by email as well. And uh, just to remind everybody that there is a survey that is really important if you can click on the link. Uh, James, if you can put it up again in the chat so people are aware and can, uh, can access and, uh, and answer a few questions. That will be great for, for Artus and for us. Um, with that, I will um, hand, well, just reinforcing that the presentation is also available in the link. Um, so whoever wants to take a look and the recordings will be available as well. So with that, I will hand over to Marcelo for final words. And uh, thank you so much. Many thanks, uh, Jane. Well, this brings us to the end of this meeting. I honestly believe, and I am sure we all agree, that today's dynamic interaction is bound to bear fruit. I leave you with this thought to ponder. RTRS fully understands that this system, this tool we have presented today is merely the first step. However, we are embarking on a journey of continued development and constant improvement. Almost 1000 products for human consumption contain soy, pharmaceutical, and cosmetic companies use soy in their products, and the list goes on and on. That is why we firmly believe that RTRS conversion factor system and the soy footprint calculator are invaluable tools. We are fully aware of the urgent need to take proper care of our people and planet. Responsible soy tools are transparent. They are available to industries, researchers, consumers, and anyone curious about devices that consider social aspects and protect our natural resources. We know well that our youth are environmentally conscious. They are our future leaders. Thus, we will start showcasing the benefits of this tool at the most prestigious universities around the world. Do check out communications and announcements. Launching is coming soon. Finally, thank you for sharing this meeting and we hope you will have gained an insight into the unique benefits of these tools. Please stay tuned for invitations to the upcoming sessions of our 2020 webinars. We look forward to seeing you as well as other organizations and colleagues at 
our future webinars. Together, collaborating in synergy, we make these meetings more meaningful and productive. Thanks a lot. Enjoy the rest of the day and see you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you.